I'm a co-founder and the former CEO of Rotten Tomatoes, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Rotten Tomatoes. So a quick intro. I'm an American-born Chinese. I went to UC Berkeley, where I majored in cognitive science, and I am a serial entrepreneur. I started six startups, four in the Bay Area, one in China, and one in Hong Kong. So what is Rotten Tomatoes? Rotten Tomatoes is a site for movie reviews and news. And the goal of Rotten Tomatoes is to save you time and money from not seeing a bad movie. So how does it work? Well, basically, we aggregate all of the reviews from professional critics for a movie, like so. And then for each review, if the critic recommends seeing the movie, we give it a fresh tomato. And if they don't recommend seeing the movie, we give it a rotten tomato. We then take the percentage of fresh reviews out of the total number of reviews to get the tomato meter score. So in this case, Aquaman has a tomato meter score of 64%. Movies with a tomato meter score of 60% or above are considered fresh, and below that are considered rotten. So let's go back to the beginning. This is my co-founder of Rotten Tomatoes and our former CTO, Stephen Wang. Prior to doing Rotten Tomatoes, the two of us co-founded a company called Design Reactor, where we did interactive design for the entertainment industry. We worked with Disney Channel, Warner Brothers, we did the official website for Jet Li, we did the official flash game for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire on ABC. Our team was mostly straight out of school and almost all from UC Berkeley. This is the creator of Rotten Tomatoes, Sen Duong. He was our creative director at Design Director, and he came up with the idea just on the side, he was a huge movie fan. So how did he come up with the idea? Well, basically, back in the day, if you open up the newspaper, you'd see a full-page ad, and it would look like a movie poster filled with quotes, basically like this. And actually, the producer of Superman Returns right there, Chris Lee. Um, and, and the idea was, back then, it didn't matter if the movie was good or not, those quotes would always be good. If the movie was good, those quotes would be from famous film critics. If the movie was bad, they would be from random radio station DJ in the middle of nowhere. So Sen's idea was, well, what if I take only quotes from professional critics, good and bad, and put it into one place? And thus, Rotten Tomatoes was born. When it first launched, it looked basically like this. This is in August 1998. And the first movies, one of the first movies Sen uh, built a Rotten Tomatoes page for was Rush Hour, because Sen was a huge Jackie Chan fan. And that was actually his motivation. He wanted to know what everyone was saying about the movie when it came out. So eventually we transitioned from Design Rector to Rotten Tomatoes. At first, Steve and I were actually against Sen putting so much time into the site because it was affecting his work at Design Rector. He was pulling all-nighters on Wednesdays and Thursdays gathering reviews, and he would come in late or call in sick, and even when we came in, he just wasn't as productive. But over the course of the next year, we gradually changed our minds, and three things in particular helped change our minds. The first was, as soon as it launched, it started getting you a cool side of the day, cool side of the week, cool side of the month from Netscape and Yahoo. Yahoo also had a magazine called Yahoo Internet Life, and in this issue, a famous film critic named Roger Ebert wrote an article highlighting his favorite movie sites, and Ron Tomatoes was one of them. The third thing was when Pixar released A Bug's Life. We saw a spike in traffic on the site, and we're like, where's it coming from? And it turned out it was coming from Pixar. And what we realized is someone at Pixar found the page for A Bug's Life on Rotten Tomatoes, forwarded it to everyone else there, and then they just started refreshing over and over to see as we were adding reviews what critics were saying about A Bug's Life. So we realized, hey, if Roger Ebert and Pixar are using, is using Rotten Tomatoes, there's got to be something there. So we combined forces. Sen, Steven, and I became co-founders of both Design Reactor and Rotten Tomatoes. I went out and raised a million US from angels uh, that were our clients at Design Reactor. And then we passed our design firm off to another group to take over so that we could focus all of our resources on Rotten Tomatoes. After we decided to make this transition, March 10th of 2000, the internet stock bubble burst. We were closing our funding around January of 2000, and actually one investor had to back out last minute. So we barely made it. 
had we started trying to raise money even like two or three months later, <coughs> most likely we would not have raised money and there might not be a Rotten Tomatoes today. So very quickly, we had to go into survival mode. One way we were able to survive was we got a deal with My Simon. So two of our investors actually introduced us over to My Simon. My Simon was a price comparison engine. And they ended up buying all of our ad inventory for $5 CPM, so $5 per 1,000 impressions. At the time that they did the deal, it was a fair deal. But because of the crash, it very quickly became a very bad deal for them because ad rates went to like pennies or even fractions of a penny. Um, and it was a one-year deal, and we were terrified the entire year that they would cancel at any minute. But luckily, I think they forgot about us because they had other things to worry about, and so they didn't cancel the deal. They didn't renew it, but it still helped keep us in business. Another way we were able to survive uh, was we were essentially forced to bootstrap. We went from 25 people to, tw to 21, to 17, to 14, to 11, and down to seven, all in the course of one year. We basically kept people hired until they could find something else so they wouldn't have a gap, but we knew we had to cut down. So in addition to myself, Stephen, and Sen, we had Lily, who was our CFO, and basically uh, our company mom, she had two sons around our age. <laughs> we had Paul who handled marketing, and then we had Susan and Bid who were our two editors. Additionally, all of us took at least a 30% pay cut, and myself and Paul, we went to zero salary. And the way I was able to do that was I moved out of my apartment, just took all my stuff, stuck it in the office, got a sleeping bag, and stuck it under my desk for half a year. We also subleased, we had a lot of extra space, so we subleased some of our extra space to our friend's company, Gamers.com. They had actually gone from 130 people to less than 10. Um, but by subleasing space, we were able to further reduce our monthly costs. So in the old model, companies would raise money, buy a lot of eyeballs in a big land grab, raise more money, kind of repeat that process a couple times, and then IPO. But after the crash, that model didn't work anymore. We had identified over 100 competitors and potential competitors within movies, entertainment, streaming video, reviews. And after the crash, it became survival of the leaders. Within one year, 90% of those companies were out of business. So who survived? On one side, you had the ultra small teams, um, sites like Anical News and Dark Horizons. And on the other side, you had the big players, companies that owned a movie site but didn't depend on that movie site to save business. So Disney owned movies.com, Yahoo had Yahoo Movies, and Amazon had IMDb. In addition to the crash in March of 2000, 18 months later was 9-11. And for companies that were dependent on advertising revenue like Rotten Tomatoes, it actually was pretty hard because after such a tragic event, no one wanted to see any advertising. So a lot of advertising budgets were slashed Ad campaigns were canceled or pushed back. But after those two events, we started to finally see a light at the end of the tunnel. We started growing. We added three more folks. Evan, who was our first real salesperson. James, who was an additional engineer. And Mark, who was an additional editor. And Mark's sitting over there, and he lives in Hawaii now. On the growth side, we focused on three areas. Traffic, revenue, and brand. On the traffic side, we generated mainly through search engine optimization and word of mouth. When we ran Rock Tomatoes, we were consistently within the top 1,000 most traffic sites in the world on Alexa. Now it's consistently in the top 500. We automated the site by working with companies such as the Movie Review Query Engine, MRQE, to automate the parsing of reviews and getting them over to us. In addition to working with MRQE, we licensed generic movie data, such as cast, crew, and filmography. We also built a critic submission tool, so critics could submit the review directly to us, tell us if it's fresh or rotten, give us a quote. So it all, not only made it, things easier for us, but also made us more accurate. All those changes allowed us to go from 10 editors down to three, Susan, Finn, and Mark. We refreshed the look of the site, tried to make things a little bit cleaner. We added movie forms, and while we were running Rock Tomatoes, our movie forms were among the most trafficked in the world. We had a weekly newsletter. The Vine, which was our attempt at like a social network, essentially allowing people to connect to their friends and write their own reviews for movies. 
We even launched into the games category temporarily to kind of show that the model could work in categories beyond movies. On the revenue side, all that bootstrapping allowed us to get to break even. We generated revenue in three ways. 50% came from advertising, 30% from affiliate deals, 20% from licensing. On the advertising side, it mostly came from banner and rich media ads, sponsorships in the weekly newsletter, and special sauce ads. So an example, New York Times featured sponsor. So they paid us to feature their movie critic more highly so that they could get more traffic. For us, we generated additional revenue in a essentially a new ad unit, um, but that critic's review didn't affect the tomato meter more than any other critic would. So it was kind of a win-win on all sides. On the affiliate deal side, we would help companies sell the product. But additionally, what was good for us is it also gave us more data. So with all posters, we had uh, movie posters and celebrity photos, but we also got those images. With Price Grabber, we got price comparison of soundtracks and DVDs, but we also got that pricing information. We worked with movietickets.com to sell movie tickets, but we also got the showtime information. And we also worked with Sideshow Toy to do movie collectibles. On the licensing side, we worked with companies such as Comcast, Netflix, and Microsoft. And then on the brand side, we did media partnerships with companies such as Daily Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, as well as new media such as Ask.com and Google Desktop. We created a new tier called Certified Fresh, and that was 75% or above, meaning at least three out of four film critics recommended seeing the movie. What was good about this was it brought in additional revenue a lot of times because when a movie was certified fresh, the studio would want to promote that fact. They would buy ad campaigns with us, but they would also integrate it into their advertising. So the first film that got certified fresh after we created it was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And if you see, they have there's a tiny little logo in the corner uh, for certified fresh. But since then, you know, many posters have incorporated the certified fresh logo. DVDs have done it, and I've seen it in movie trailers on TV. We created the Golden Tomato Awards, which is like our version of the Oscars, and they're actually harder to get than Oscars because we don't give out as many. <laughs> and one of the early films to get a Golden Tomato was Finding Nemo, and here's a shot of the two directors of Finding Nemo with a box of fresh tomatoes from Rotten Tomatoes. Another way we grew was through word of mouth, and this is probably the best example of word of mouth ever. Uh, now this this movie is actually getting it's getting great reviews. It's on. Uh, uh, you ever go on Rotten Tomatoes? No. Rotten Tomatoes is like a, it's like a website that reviews uh, uh, movies before they I, I guess before they come out. Or, Did we get any any? You got very good reviews. You got full tomatoes, which is which is good. Like not not rotten ones. No. If you get a tomato, that means that uh, a certain percentage of people say it's good. I think it's over like seventy percent say it's good. And if not, you get, I'm not even sure why they do this, an asterisk, which makes no sense in terms of a tomato. <laughs> so if, you, if, you're, if your movie is bad, there's an asterisk next to it. And if it's good, a delicious tomato. And we got a delicious tomato. A delicious tomato. So congratulations. <laughs> Very excited. Eternal, uh, uh, Eternal Sunshine also got a tomato. It did? Yeah. That, that's, yeah, it's good. Gentle asterisk. <laughs> So when this came out, I was actually rooming with Mark at the time, and I don't normally watch The Daily Show, he does. And I was out in the kitchen, my grave was in food. And then suddenly Jon Stewart starts talking about Rotten Tomatoes. And we were just like freaking out, we're like, oh my god, oh my god. And like grabbing our cell phones, trying to call our friends and be like, turn on The Daily Show. And, and yeah, even to this day, I think this is probably the most exciting thing for me ever as far as Rotten Tomatoes. So after all that, we eventually sold the company. We had some early offers from iFilm, which is almost like YouTube before YouTube, and eUniverse, which is best known for helping to create MySpace. But these offers were pennies on the dollar. Our investors actually wanted us to take those deals, but we want, by that time, we were already break even, and we felt like we should at least wait until we could sell and the investors could get all their money back. So we didn't take those. Later on, we got offers from IG Entertainment, which is a gaming site, Hollywood.com, CNET, which owned GameSpot, and Google. 
and we ended up selling to IGN. And the reason why was Hollywood.com couldn't match IGN's offer. CNET could, but they had more VPs than IGN had people. It just felt like they were too big and too bureaucratic. Google was also very big. We actually would have loved to sell to them, but they only approached us three weeks before we were going to close our entire deal with IGN. We had signed a no-shop agreement. We had already spent over 300000 in legal fees, you know, doing due diligence and everything with IGN. And we just thought, one, it's kind of risky to try to wait out the no-shop to talk to Google, or it's very bad faith and illegal to try to go around them to don't talk. So we said, you know what, let's just sell to IGN. Looking back, maybe it would have been a better idea to sell to Google. But at the same time, we don't know if the site would even be around now had we done so. So why did we sell? Well, when we started it, everyone was low to mid-20s. By the time we sold, we were late 20s to early 30s. People were getting married, having kids, buying houses, buying cars. And we thought, you know what, if we sell, people get some money, and they can kind of move to the next phase of their life. For me, being an ABC, I wanted to try something new. I wanted to see what Asia was like. So myself and my co-founder, Steven, both ended up moving to China, and then later to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we worked on a site called Alive Not Dead, which was like my space for Asia, working with celebrities and artists over there to connect with each other and to their fans. It doesn't really exist anymore, but it was a good experience. So what happened after the sale? We sold IGN in 2004. A year later, they sold to News Corp. In 2010, News Corp sold Rotten Tomatoes over to Flickster. A year after that, Flickster, along with Rotten Tomatoes, sold to Warner Brothers. And then five years after that, Warner Brothers sold Flickster, along with Rotten Tomatoes, to Fandango. So Fandango owns it now. So a quick timeline of what the site has looked like under different owners. This is what it looked like roughly when it launched. And then after our refresh, this is what it looked like with IGN. And then News Corp. And then Flickster. Warner Brothers, Fandango. So as you can see, Fandango actually changed from kind of a green to a red. They actually refreshed the logo, so it's different now. And they went to much more like white and kind of clean looking. I'm biased, I kind of like our earlier versions where we had more color, I, I feel like it had more personality. The brand has continued to grow over the years. For one year, year and a half in 2009, there was actually a Rotten Tomatoes show on current TV, and wanted to show you the opening intro for you movie buffs to see if you can get the movie references in the intro. Shall we take a look at the best of sin and vice in the movies? The top five drugs, the best parties, the worst kisses, they're all here. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get dirty. <laughs> Everybody, I'm Red Early. And I'm Ellen Fox. Here's also a sizzle reel for Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes is the go to place now. What's your Elysium? It's me. Tomatoes, the thing on Apple TV? That's right. Wow. I like Rotten Tomatoes. God bless you for saying such a thing. Well, what else is there? Do they use rotten tomatoes to make that body marry? No, they're 100% fresh, my friend. Hey! I got one of those cool rotten tomato awards for Garden State when it was certified fresh. I'm a rotten tomatoes fan. As long as they're a fan of me. <laughs> rotten tomatoes has also been in a lot of pop culture references. We were, we were in a book about vampires called Twilight. <laughs> There was an episode of South Park that referenced Rotten Tomatoes. It was called Splatty Tomato. And Rick even mentioned Certified Fresh in an episode of Rick and Morty. Rotten Tomatoes has also been extended to the tomato meter into many platforms, including Apple TV and iTunes. And here's Steve Jobs talking a little bit about that. Here's a great example I want to highlight. This film, I didn't have to see this film, I'm sure most of us didn't, but you know, this film got a 95% on the tomato meter at Rotten Tomatoes, which is the best review site out there, and now we have a chance to see these kinds of films, and have them brought into our consciousness that we might not normally 
have had the opportunity to see. So from what I've heard, he was actually a huge Rotten Tomatoes fan, and he actually mentioned us in three separate keynotes, this being one of them. So that's it. Thank you all at East East West. Thank you for having me. Thanks for attending. If you want to reach me, you can find me on Rockdale, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Thank you.